All right, well, thank you, everybody. We're going to get started. We have two pretty big legends here today. We've got Jim Shearer and Mike Carwell. So thank you very much for coming, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, usually, I start these just by uh, asking how you both got into the industry, because everybody's got a little bit of a different story, and some are more well-known than others. So how, uh, how did you both get into the industry? You want to start? Sure. Yours is more interesting. Than, uh, I'll start mine. Um, I originally started as a sports cartoonist in 1978. And then I noticed that uh, Dick Giordano, I had heard that Dick Giordano was looking for an assistant. And uh, I answered the ad, I showed him my portfolio, and uh, in late 1979, I became Giordano's assistant. I remained uh, with him for about mm, 18 months, soaking in all of his enormous knowledge and talents as, as I could. And then he helped introduce me around to DC to uh, Joe Orlando and, and some of the other important editors. And by very early 81, I started getting my own work. Uh, I think Green Lantern was probably my first regular assignment. Um, mostly, I probably know for my time on Green Lantern, uh, time with George Perez on Teen Titans and Crisis, a fairly long stretch on Batman uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, I spent four or five years with Marvel, uh, doing Thor, some Iron Man, Conan, a few others. Uh, I spent many, many years uh, working with The Simpsons on, on their books. I worked with Warner on Looney Tunes. I worked with Archie Comics. I worked with Nickelodeon. I worked with Disney Publishing. Uh, I think I, at one point I ran out of places to work for it. So um, yeah, for 40 years I've kind of been all over the place. I don't really do comic books anymore. Um, I do a lot of private commission work or for companies looking for artwork. I do an occasional book cover or an album cover. I do a lot of just work for people who email me and say, my son is graduating, he's a great Wolverine fan, would you do a drawing for him? So I, I do tons of that stuff. And uh, I, I do uh, a lot of conventions. So i probably more busy at the age of 62 than I was at 32, but I don't care, it, it's fine. It's uh, not really work. Anyway, uh, this gentleman here, Huh? Started at the age of 13, which is amazing to me, so I will let Mr. Shooter take over the... Yeah, I decided I wanted to do comics when I was 12, and uh, to make money, and because my family needed money. And um, so I spent a year kind of trying to figure out how, and I thought I had it down. You know, I was 13. I wrote a story, sent it to DC. And uh, long story short, they, they sent them three stories, and they bought all those, and they said, we want you to be a regular writer. I lived 400 miles away, so they didn't know how young I was. They didn't know The editor thought I was a college student. And uh, so anyway, but I worked my way through. They found out eventually, and they, they got over it, and um, worked my way through high school and for DC. And then uh, after that, my life has been a string of disasters. Um, <laughs> now I worked. I, 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 you know, worked for DC, and and the guy I worked with, he, he was just hard to work for, and so I, I thought maybe I'd try working at Marvel. I actually did work at Marvel for about two, two or three weeks, uh, but to work at Marvel, you had to live in New York, and you're if you're, 18 years old and got no money and you don't know anybody there and you're trying to move there and you had like you know 50 bucks in your pocket to last you the next two weeks, and yeah, it's bad. So I, uh, I finally I, I couldn't, I just couldn't survive there. I mean, I love the job, but I just couldn't couldn't take it. So I went home and and I was you know I saw I got a, a regular job. Then I started getting advertising work, 
all comics format. They said, I got these calls. Oh, you're that kid who does comics, right? Yeah, you know. And I got hired to work for uh, U.S. Steel and Levi's Jeans and a whole bunch of other places, writing stuff, and, you know, designing things. Uh, and then uh, yeah, after that, you know, in and out, I, I worked for DC Comics for a little while. Again, uh, then uh, I got hired by Marvel. I worked for Marvel for 10 or 12 years, and most of that was pretty good. And uh, we changed things a lot for the better for creators, introduced royalties and benefits, and some of those guys became millionaires, you know. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, before that, it was awful. I mean, you paid nothing, and, and you, all you got was your paycheck, no benefits, no rights, no nothing. Um, so that was good, you know. And Marvel was, because of our success, Marvel was being bought and sold, and I sort of became a labor leader, so they spit me out like a watermelon seed. Um, and then I started a couple of companies on my own, and each one of those was a disaster in its own way. Started Valiant, went through hell to try to build it. Once I built it and it was successful, I had one evil partner, and he married one of the bankers, and so he became her partner, not my partner. And they had me outvoted on the board, so when the, the company was worth a lot of money, they managed to get rid of me and take all the money. Uh, sold the company to a claim and got all the money. Um, so I thought, well, what am I going to do? I start again. So I, I started a company called uh, Defiant, <laughs> and uh, uh, and that that went pretty. That, that was starting to go up pretty well. Uh, we had some big opportunities. Uh, two things went wrong. Marvel sued me and lost, but they, it cost me three hundred thousand dollars to win. And uh, that took a, you take three hundred thousand dollars out of a small startup. That that's the kiss of death. Um, and uh, the judge actually lectured him after the trial was over, and he read his opinion, which was a glowing review of our stuff. Uh, he called the lawyers up to the uh, table, and he said he put his hand over the mic, but I could still hear him. He said, "You ever use my court as a business weapon again, you will sincerely regret it." You know, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> He, he was a smart guy. He later became the Attorney General of the United States. Um, so I wasn't dealing with lightweights here. Uh, so that, that, you know, that didn't work out either. I mean, that ended up uh, killing us. Uh, and uh, we had a $9 million toy deal guarantee with Mattel, and Marvel managed to kill that because the lawsuit strung us out past our window, and that deal fell apart. Um, so I went again. I, I started a company with Lauren Michaels called Broadway Comics, and we just turned the corner on that. And Lauren Michaels, who was the general partner, sold us, along with a whole bunch of other stuff like Lassie and The Lone Ranger and some Christmas movies and things, to Golden Books Family Entertainment, which promptly went bankrupt. And so I was on the street again. Um, but uh, and I did freelance. I'd worked for Dark Horse. I worked for DC again for a while. I, I you know, worked for small indie companies. I, I. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, between you know, you know catch as catch can and, and social security, I mean, I'm still alive. And uh, uh, all in all, uh, it had you know there was a lot of rough play patches, but it was all in all it wasn't a bad ride. It was good, and I still do stuff. I, I image comics. Uh, some guys who are working for image comics, although they may end up dark, but they they uh, hired me to uh, sort of be the coach. I'm not really the editor because I'm not hiring and firing people, but they send everything to me and they say, tell us what's wrong with it. And I tell them, and to my utter amazement, they listen. That's never happened before. So uh, um, so anyway, I'm doing that. That's kind of fun. And, you know, I do some indie stuff once in a while, but they don't have any money, so I do it for free. Um, and, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not working as hard as I used to, and I'm having fun, so that's good. So and that's more than you needed to know, I know. <laughs> so, um, I guess, Mike, I'll ask you a question. You're uh, really well known for your inking on a lot of um, other artists' uh, uh, pencils. Now, um, inking, of course, is is different, but it's an incredibly important part of the comic book. Wait a minute, that's just tracing the lines, right? That's not really doing it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that, uh, <laughs> but I hope he knows I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. But um, can you tell us what, uh, or talk to us a little bit about what it's like having to, you know, basically bring out the art off the page with the inks? 
An interesting question, <laughs> and uh, I wish I had the gift of brevity, but I don't know how to, to, to say it quickly. Every artist that I worked with was different, um, from Mike Grell to Mike Zeck. Uh, people like Kurt Swan and Gene Cohen were very difficult to ink because there was a lot of subtlety. Uh, some pencilers were very stark, and you could easily bl uh, blend your thoughts with theirs because it was their thoughts were so concrete. Uh, the the fine line was not imposing your will on what they were trying to do. And uh, be quiet. And um, I would run into a rough patch once in a while because an editor would really like what I was doing and the penciler would complain. So I would have to listen to the editor because he was paying me. I mean, I ran into that on Thor, especially, where the, the penciler just didn't like what I was doing, but the editor was thrilled because he felt I was fixing it. Did he tell you to fix it in the ink? Yes. Okay. No, I mean, not the editors do that. No, I, I but yet the, the, the penciler kept calling me privately and saying, how dare you do this? I said, okay. what do you want me to do? The editor is telling me to do this. Yeah. I, you're not hiring me, you're not paying me, he is. Almost no penciler I know was like thrilled with, with the inking, with possible exception of Gene Cullen with Tom Palmer. Mm. They got along. Mm -hmm. A few, few other combinations like that. But almost every penciler complains about the inker. And, and usually, if, then when they grow up a little bit, uh, I mean, I'm Dave Lapp on my head. Um, John Dixon inking him for a while. And John was a very accomplished artist. And, and he would, in subtle ways, you know, he thought he was getting across what David intended and, and you know, trying to just help it a little. David said, he's ruining it, you know. And, and David's the most reasonable guy on earth. I mean, I think it's a natural penciler thing. And then years later, uh, I was talking to David and he said, he said, you know, I never realized how much he was saving my ass. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, he really did. He was helping. But, but, you know, you see it in your mind a certain way if you're a penciler and he didn't do it exactly that way. And what's wrong? So maybe it's better. Well, the um, I think the greatest compliment I ever got was from Jim Apparel. There you go. Who did, as you know, Batman for years and probably one of the greatest pencilers, and artists we ever had. One of the most famous stretch runs of Batman of the late '80s when they killed off uh, Jason Todd. But I knew him a little bit personally, and he said, "You know, Mike, you're the only anchor." that I really trust inking my pencils other than when I ink my pencils because he mostly before had inked his own work and he told me that and that made me proud that somebody who I respected said something that nice to me and uh, you know sometimes you, you feel like people appreciate it and I've had editors like I hate to say Denny O'Neill he's probably a good friend of yours who yeah, said he's, he's a good guy yeah, he, he says, I wouldn't know a good ink job from a bad ink yes, job, so don't talk to me about it at all. So uh, to wrap it all up in your initial question, I, uh, I gave up inking other people's stuff a long time ago. I, I pencil and ink my own stuff But now. you can, and then you always could. And I, it's I nice can, you, you know, if I ever had to fall back on it, I could, but... It can sometimes be uh, something where you feel underappreciated. Yeah. Well, you know, I've made the, the oh, you just have to follow the lines joke. But the, the, it's, it's not. It's, it's not. a joke, and I've it heard that joke. many times. Seriously, what do you do? Trace the penciler's line. Well, the thing is, the thing is, like, picture this. Or you get this pencil drawn. And he, as he said, some are more crisp and some are less crisp. But, but it's basically, this guy's working with smudgy gray, you know? And, it, and so he might shade something in, 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 in 
wooden pencil is a nice light gray. Now you're an inker. Do I make that black? Do I make it, to leave it open and hope the colorist does the right thing? Do I do what they call uh, 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 cutting in some white, which is like, like letting a little bit of white show through in your rendering and stuff like that to make it a kind of a gray? And in ancient days, they did zip -a tone and stuff. Um, but, but the point is, it's like you get this smudgy stuff. And for instance, he said Gene Colan. He was an excellent inker on Gene Colan. Gene Colan would draw like with the side of his pencil. Like, what do you do with that? <laughs> so, how do I ink this? It's, tra it's a translation. You're, you're translating. Bingo. Bingo. Uh, I think he knows who he's talking about. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Done this for a while? <laughs> But anyway, I, as I said, I'm not known for brevity, so I apologize. Oh, you got two of the longest talkers here. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, Jim, you, with, in all your travels, I mean, there's a lot of characters that you are uh, responsible for. Creating. Well, it's my fault. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> is, is, there, um, is there one character that stands out amongst the others? All the way in all your different travels that uh, you you know you would say is your favorite to write. Yeah, it's hard. It's like whatever. This sounds stupid. I'm going to say it anyway. But when I'm writing a character, the, the the only way I think there is to write it is you can get into it. You have to wrap your brain in there. I'm writing Captain America. There's nothing in the world like Captain America. Captain America is the best thing there ever was. If I'm writing Spider-Man, I can't think of anything else. You know. And so I, and that's, it, I, I've trained myself to do this, so I do a better job on the, on the, on the characters. And, and if it isn't good, then I'm not good. But, but the thing is, that's the way I do it. So whatever I'm writing at the moment is like the most important thing in the world to me. And then, uh, um, and if you can maintain that, you know, then, then the, you get the best out of yourself that, the, that you can, you know, whatever's there. Um, but if somebody says, what's your favorite thing you wrote? I would probably say, P.S. I don't like writing. Writing is hell. It's it's really hard. I like having written. Dorothy Parker. I like it when it's over. You know. <laughs> huh? Dorothy Parker. <laughs> Did she say that? Oh, good. I'm in good company. But uh, 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 but anyway, like uh, I, I did a job with this guy, David Lapham, a young man, just starting out, but he was great right off the bat. He was like Frank Miller, you know. It was like right away, he's good. And. Uh, I worked on something called Harbinger, and I think we did the first, I don't know, 10 or 12 issues together, I can't remember. We did uh, Up Through Unity together, I guess. And, uh, and th th that was like so much fun, because uh, not only would he understand what I wanted and give it to me better than I deserved, but then he would find little touches that put in, like just some character in the background reacting, or you know, something that we didn't call for, but he knew he knew it would be good to have it there. You know, some little gesture, some little expression. And it was just such a pleasure writing with him because he was so good. And we really had kind of a, you know, simpatico and, and, uh, and that was fun. And that's always the best is when you get working with somebody who's, you're really on the same page and you really, you know, have that connection. So we did, I, I, we did uh, some, some stories together and it was just so much fun to do, and uh, that's, that's it, that was my favorite. What about you? What, are, what was your big thing? Well, I think the, that, that notoriety period in the late 80s with Batman, Batman. was probably uh, the highlight of my comic tenure, so to speak. Yeah, I think Everybody. for a while it was the the largest selling comic book in America, selling about a half month for three or yeah. four years, um, and uh, I was proud to be part of it. And I think that's why I'm still invited to uh, comic shows to this day. That you or me? It's me. I didn't expect anybody to be calling me, but okay. <laughs> <clears throat> but to follow up a little bit of what Jim was saying is um, I also do some tutoring and teaching on the side, seminars sometimes. And I, I tell people to, um, you're, you're not only a movie director when you're drawing, but you're one of the actors too. Yeah. And 
if you're drawing Captain America, how would Captain America stand? How would he respond? How would the Hulk, the Hulk is gonna stand and have a posture much different than Spider-Man. So it, it's, it's getting into the character, it's being a movie director, it's, uh, it's knowing how to sequence. There's um, stuff I don't know if they're teaching nowadays. Not anymore. But um, really, it's, it's you're a, a movie director, you're a prop man, you're an actor, you're a writer. You're also a businessman. You're the producer of the movie too. You've got to manage the schedule and the budget, and you've got to, you know, uh, uh, you're on the phone to talent, trying to get people. And it's it's a it's a the good most editor grueling doesn't training ground I think there is. Because uh, yeah. when I go into other areas now, as I said, I don't really do monthly comics anymore. I find dealing with other people, other companies so easy and they find my facility with whatever they're talking about alarming. I say, well, you don't know what it's like to have done comic books for 35 years. The, the pressure you were under, the, the demand, the, the level of proficiency that had to be maintained. So, um, of course, yeah, this that, yeah, that, that What do you said about this level of proficiency? I mean, I, uh, comic book artists as a whole are the, are the best artists on earth. Because, because let's, you can accept great advertising artists. Yeah, they pose models. They take two weeks. They put tracing paper over, and they fool with it, and they fiddle with it, and stuff like that. They, this guy's got to, if you're doing regular comic books, you've got to do it all out of your head. The perspective's got to be right. The proportions have got to be right. You've got to make this room look like this room, and you've got to do that 12 times a day. That's a lot. That's hard. And. You're not posing any models. You're not using any, you know, uh, any tissue paper. You're, you're the great thing today is you do have the internet. So if you don't know what you know a certain kind of rifle looks like, you can look it up. You know, but uh, uh, other than that, you know, uh, I used to spend a lot of time in the library for that reason. I, you know, to look stuff up. There is no such thing as a silver surfer evading laser blasts in outer space. So if it's not up here, it, it's not there at but all. To, but to see that in your mind and put that on the paper and do it again and again and again every day, and it has to look right, and the perspective's got to be right. And it's not only for guys doing the realistic stuff. Duckburg was always in perfect perspective when Carl Barks drew it. You know, and they may have been driving duck cars and having dog-nosed policemen and stuff, but they were always perfectly proportioned. It was always right. Uh, if you can remember the old, old ancient Captain Marvel drawn by C.C. Beck, he did a very simple cartoon style. And yet, if, it, if the angle was right, you could see the bump where the collarbone hits the shoulder. Always in the right place. <laughs> Classically trained people. Yeah, exactly. Nobody's trained at all anymore. I mean, a lot of people, their, their main qualification these days is that they've read a thousand comics. You know? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I went through boot camp. I went through hell. Um, <laughs> You know, after I, I was lucky, I got I sold some stuff and then got trained on the job. But still, you, know, you have to learn. Uh, and what he said about being an actor and everything, that all applies to the writer, too. You know, what would really happen here? Uh, how would he react? You know, um, and then I always tell people, I said, you know, your job as a cartoonist, writer, artist, everybody, is you don't, when you think of a story, you don't, Think of a series of still pictures in your mind. Think of a little movie, right? Your job is to make those people see the same movie, right? If you can do that, then you're you're Frank Miller and you're rich. And that's cool, you know. But uh, uh, and then part of that is the acting, and it, it, it's it's a it's a really interesting art form. And uh, people say, well, movies have the advantages uh, because they have sound and they have motion. No, they don't. With comics, you have absolute control of the message. Every mark you make on that paper sends a message. Send the right one, you know? And so, uh, I do my little my comedy routine here. I mean, if you have Superman sitting, he sits nobly and erect, you know? Like he said. You have Superman standing, and he's noble and erect, right? In the movie, sooner or later he's going to sit down and you get this, which is not very 
you know, noble. Yeah, the in, the in between. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, so so the movies you have this, you have always have the disadvantage of reality. In comics, every single line, every single mark you make in that paper can send an iconic message, and so you you can hit harder and deeper, and the best ones do. I say Frank because everybody knows Frank Miller, but uh, there's several guys like that. My, my favorite of all time is Russ Heath. Yeah. You studied Russ Heath. Yeah. Studied him religiously. Yeah, well, he's great. You know, he's one of the few artists that my good friend Neil Adams speaks of in rever reverential <laughs> tones. So Neil's pretty sure he's good. <laughs> you know, you mentioned Russ, he says, oh, he's good. You know. But uh, anyway. Oh, well, at this point, I was going to open it up to questions from those right here. Or if you want to hear funny stories about anybody who has been in this industry for about 50 years, we can tell you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I got uh, two questions, that's all right. Um, you guys mentioned that uh, you know when you're an inker, you sometimes get things from artists where the pencil's used weird, or is it a shadow, is it black, should I make it you know, kind of whitish, that kind of stuff. As an inker, how do you, like, how do you find that blend between, you know, what you want, uh, what the, you know, penciler may want, and go from that? Like, do you, do you have a conversation? Do you communicate, or did you communicate with them, or just, there's ah, a, I'm going to do this now. There's a lot of psychology involved. You have to know, you have to know the editor, what his parameters are in regards to what you can do. You have to know the, the penciler and what his parameters are. Um, see, in my mind, I, I'm always thinking of, of graphics and gradation. I hate to use art terms, but um, graphic design, you know, uh, light sources, anything to round out an image, anything to make the image look three-dimensional. But then, you know, if a guy's got a reputation and the light source is not done very well, or if the shoulder doesn't look right, or if one eye is lower than the other, you say to yourself, is it my job to, to go that extra length to fix it? Is he gonna be insulted? Is the editor gonna say, Mike, just leave this stuff alone? So, you know, you, you have to be a psychologist to be a long time anchor, as I was. Yeah. There's a lot of tight rope walking. Another thing, and I'm sure you'll back me up on this, the business has changed. Back well, in, in when I started, the editor was God, you know, and you just did what you were told and shut up. Um, and, uh, and, and also, in those days, the, everybody tended to be way more professional. I mean, I was 13 years old, 14 years old. I'm doing these scripts and doing little layouts for the artist. And the artists, all-time greats, Wally Wood, Kurt Swan, Gil Kane, they did what I asked them to do. They didn't complain about it. They, the, the writer wants this, okay, fine. They actually appreciated the fact that I did layouts because it did kind of make, made it easier for them in a way. Uh, so in those days, it was all very, you know, it was a good commercial art job and you're doing it and it's, you know it's kind of fun and you know and then everybody was a real professional about it they did their jobs the editor was God he told you you know he wanted a certain thing you did it you know by the time I got there it was more like the studio system in Hollywood I mean I had um, uh, the, the talent was very important but it was it was the editor was more like the editor uh, was the director and producer and would help creatively and stuff, and, and actually tr teach people and train people. And, and uh, uh, but there was a greater greater appreciation just of talent in my day. I think that because I got editors like Archie Goodwin and, and Louise Simonson and Larry Hama, uh, who had been artists and writers themselves, they had a lot of appreciation. So so they they to some they were attracted to the, the, the best people. Nowadays it's like Hollywood today, where it's the star system. In other words, if Travolta wants to do it, it, it gets done. And if he doesn't want to do it, it doesn't get done. And, and if he wants a certain director, he gets a certain director. So, so that right now, when you what you have is, is there are a few people who are new enough or not popular enough or whatever that they kind of get told what to do. And if they complain, so what? There's a lot of people, the, the Brian, what's his face, Bendis guys, and the 
you know some of the some of the big artists um, you know no editor is going to tell them what to do you know that the, the editor is has become an expediter he just processes the stuff through just the way Bendis wants it and uh, and so and nobody's teaching anything anymore so so what happens is you know this is I think you'll agree with this um, more often these days if you've got a big name artist he dictates who he wants to ink it he doesn't Absolutely. want to ink it himself okay Absolutely. and he'll he'll tell the editor I don't like that colorist or, or I want this guy or whatever so like there it's more of a big name star is kind of dictating what's going on and the editor's just kind of turning the crank and getting it through getting the lettering done and uh, uh, I think there's too much of that today and and not enough uh, teaching and direction and and you know I mean I, I'm, maybe I'm a jerk but I, I'll tell you one time one of a big star in my day I won't tell you who. I mean, he came to me, and I, I didn't want him to do a certain thing. And he said, "But I'm so and so." And I said, "I don't give a damn who you are. You know, this is, <laughs> it's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. Um, uh, we're entrusted to do this. We have to do it right. You know. And uh, uh, so anyway, I mean, yeah, but now they care who you are. Now they really care who you are." And, and so, and that you were, you told me, I'm not going to name the artist because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But Terry Austin, the anchor, you know Terry, he uh, came to me once and he shows me this drawing where this guy who was starting to get hot, he was, eventually he was a star, but at first he was kind of a, doing a lot of swipes. The trouble is when you swipe, sometimes this part of the picture doesn't fit that part of the picture. Do you know what I mean by swipe? It's like you trace somebody else's work. Okay. So this guy was doing a lot of tracing of Neil Adams. Anyway, uh, so Terry was supposed to ink this job. And he comes and he shows me this figure, a big shot of the main character. He says, look at this. And I said, yeah. It's because for the other company. It was, it, it was a DC job, and I was the editor-in-chief of Marvel. He says, Jim, you got to help me here. I said, what? He says, how do I ink this? I'm looking at it. I said, there's something funny about that figure. And then I realized, you can see both pectorals, right? And both hips, <laughs> and you see both butt cheeks oh. and both shoulder blades. I think it's like the figure was split in half down the opposite side and spread open like this. He says, "Do I ink it, or do I fix it?" And I said, "Well, uh, I'd ask my editor, and I know probably he's just going to say ink it." But um, but you know, I mean that, that that dilemma comes up sometimes with the eyes in the wrong place or something, and do you do you fix it or not? And generally speaking, in my day, you'd show it to Larry Hom and say, "Fix it," you know. But um, but I, I mean, these days I don't I don't know. They're all stars, so who knows what happens. And, and, uh, the second one, you guys have both worked for a ton of different companies. Uh, who's the best? <laughs> the ones I ran. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think. You know, different times, different companies were good. I mean, there was a period when I started at Marvel, it was a terrible, it was a snake pit. They did no no rights, no benefits, no nothing. But we changed that, and and, and it got good for me. And, and I, I, the miracle from heaven, I got the best talent, just for all kinds of reasons, one way or another. Archie Goodwin needed a gig. It was the best of all time, maybe the best of all time. Louise uh, Simonson was working at Warren. Warren was going under. She was available. Uh, Larry Hama got cut out of some place and needed work. Get Larry Hama. So I was going down the hall here. I mean, it starts with John Romita, Grandmaster Hall of Fame. Oh, that's my art director. You know, and then each each office, there's a genius. There's, there's Louise. There's, there's Larry. There, there's Denny. There's, you know, uh, 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 Carl Potts eventually was, became a great editor. And, Bob Budiansky, and I mean, it's just like that guy that who's who of comics, you know, which fine. And I didn't, they could, they knew what to do. I didn't need to hear from me. He told Larry Hama anything, he'd growl at you, you know. But, uh, um, uh, you know, I mean, so we had, we had great people for a few years there. It was really good because people started making money, they had benefits, they had life insurance, they had great health insurance. Marvel, we were on a roll. I said, if it's work for hire, I can't change that, but I'll tell you what. If it's work fire, it's going to be fair, and that means we pay for all materials, pencils, pens, ink, everything. We always provided the paper because we didn't want pencilers to be saving money by using crappy paper. 
So, so we always provide the paper. We provide everything. Pay the post, pay the phone calls, pay the transport. And uh, it became fair. And then also, then there were royalties. The guys making lots of money. And, and, and so for a few years there, it was really great. We had the greatest guys. We had the who's who of comics. We were marching from victory to victory. We went from 30% of the market in those few years to 70% of the market. It was a rising market. And it, it helped, Marvel to help make them a rising market because we were doing good stuff. But DC was fighting back. They're doing Watchmen. They're doing Dark Knight. You know, so the whole market was going up. And in that rising market, DC and Marvel started each at 30%. After a few years, Marvel was 70%, and DC had fallen to 18%. But in the rising market, 18% was bigger than their 30% used to be. They were still a little peaked. But, uh, but no, I mean, those were great years. And so being in Marvel at that time was just, just great. And, you know, uh, depends on which era of which company. Valiant was fun for a while. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I think um, this probably doesn't just apply to comics, but companies rarely remain st stagnant or consistent for more than six or seven years at a time. Um, what may be a great company in 1990 might be a horrible company in 1997. Depending on the upper echelon, who's making the decisions, who's selling this to this person or that. I mean, Jim knows this better than I. But uh, I saw The Simpsons go from being a fantastic company to work with to being not so pleasant to work with anymore and I, I just Is this Bongo? Yes. Bongo. Bongo. And I just Bongo stopped working for them because it wasn't pleasant anymore. All the editors had changed, replaced with people I wasn't fond of. Um, Attitudes changed. I, uh, okay. I can say I, I think no matter what business you're in, and, uh, uh, it'd be rare to find a business uh, that's great at this point, 30 years later, is pretty much the same. I think Disney was a lot different under Walt than it was under Eisner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the the characters. Oh, yeah. I mean, was so rich, but you had character villains that were villains for the entire universe, like Master Dark and stuff like that, where they... That was after, Master Dark was after my time, but yes. Well, yeah. you know, they had several characters, like... Well, we had Harada, who was behind a lot of things, but... But we had other villains too. I mean, my, one of my problems with Master Dark is that every time something happened, the, the shock ending at the end of it was Master Dark was behind it. Yeah. And for a guy who was behind everything, he never accomplished anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, how bad can it be? What, uh, what do you think about villains like, uh, as far as today? Well, when I was a kid, I mean, my comics philosophy was very, very much influenced by, by Stan and Jack and Steve back in the 60s. And, you know, it's like every time you pick up an issue of Spider-Man. It's a new villain. It's it's at first it was the, the chameleon, and then it's uh, the vulture, and then the it's it's uh, Sandman, and the lizard, and Doctor Doom, Octopus. and Doctor Octopus. And, I mean, it was just this, every issue you're getting something new and something different, and also other new characters, supporting characters, heroes, or they, they were introduced too. There was a lot of creation going on, and I thought that's the way to do it. I mean, that's that's cool. And so when I came to Marvel, I. I uh, every stuff I ever wrote, I tried to do that. I mean, when I was doing the Legion of Superheroes in the early 2000s, there was a different villain, pretty much every issue, and, and there was you know some new characters being introduced. I introduced some new Legionnaires. I created the, recreated the Legion of, of Substitute Heroes. I had you know I, I kept trying to make sure that there was a lot of content every issue, a lot of stuff happening. You didn't want to miss it, you know. And um, and I like I said, I learned that from Stan and Jack and Steve, and uh, I, I think that. Uh, like I said, when I came into comics uh, as, a, as an official, as the editor-in-chief of Marvel, and, and everybody was getting their page rate, that's it, you got nothing else, you don't own anything, you know, you create something, the company owns it. 
and uh, and that's it. And I think that right right around that time, a lot of creators were starting to say, "Hey, wait, you know," especially because you know, like Jack and Steve had created all this stuff, and they got nothing. And uh, and so a lot of creators were starting to get real precious about giving in to Marvel. And so instead of having a new villain that they would create, you get the Doctor Octopus again, or you know, the Green Goblin all the time, or whatever. And uh, you know, I mean. So I introduced a, a system where, where you owned a piece of any new thing you created. And, uh, and even if you created a title, you owned a little piece of that. So, uh, um, so I mean, and that, was, that gave some incentive. And there were also guys who were just irrepressible. Bill Mantlow would create stuff by the ton all the time. Just to, you know, just, uh, he was a machine. He would, he would just create stuff like crazy. Um, uh, Claire went to a lot of characters he would create. Um, uh, a few other guys. Uh, he, for a while, you know, when Marv Wolfman worked for us, that was one of his big strengths. He'd create a lot of characters and stuff. And, and uh, so I thought, that's, that's good. And I encouraged it. And then, um, and it came in handy. I mean, like uh, Bill Manlow, I don't know if you know, he had, a, he had a terrible accident. And the fact that he created, happened to have created Rocket Raccoon, <laughs> has been giving his family a lot of money to help take care of him and stuff. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of these guys, they, 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 they benefited them, and a lot more creation was done. But I think still, to this day, there's this residual thing where, you know, everybody, they, they, they have an idea, and they act like it's the only idea they were going to have, and they better, you know, protect it, and, you know, and, and therefore it never sees a light of day, and therefore it never makes them a dime, whereas if they, you know, did it for Dark Horse, they, they don't have these, you know. Uh, but uh, I don't know, so I, I, but that was my theory, was I just, you know, I want this book to succeed, and I'm, I don't care if I own anything. I'm going to make it succeed because I can always have more ideas, you know. And and it, and if I do this, they need me, you know. And uh, so I try my best. So Legion of Heroes, everything I ever wrote, I always try to do do like standing. And and uh, you know, I mean, the Valiant, for instance, when I was there, I mean, we were constantly introducing characters and new villains. You know. Uh, yeah, try to keep keep it interesting. I mean, make it something I would want to read. And, uh, and we had some good guys too, so that, that helped. You know, that I sometimes I've been asked, do you uh, do you have a real dry spell? Do you sit at the drawing board and just nothing will come out, or you erase and erase and start it over fifty times? And when I say no, people look at me like, what? It's just like every time I sit down, it's like I'm ready and it just comes out of me, it pours out of me. He's a it's a flow and I don't know what I would do without doing it every day. So I, I never understood people who said, you know, oh, I just couldn't draw today or just nothing came out or I just didn't have a feel for it. I, I never understood that. It's just like. I knew guys, writers who always say, oh, I'm having writer's block. Have you had time for writer's book? I mean, yeah. it had to get done. Just write. You know, and, and uh, you know, f so you keep writing, and uh, maybe what you write is garbage, but somewhere in there will be a grain of an idea and say, oh, no, that's it. And now you know how to do it, and you throw this away, and keep, and keep what you got that's good, and keep going, keep going, keep going. You know, and if you don't, uh, I, think, I think some of these guys who just ponder it too much, it gets kind of stagnant, you know? And, and I, I do get sick of seeing the same villains again and again, or like you're saying, no villains. <laughs> Yeah. I have, uh, excuse me, I have tutored students who I would see once a week and they would come the next week with like two or three little sketches and after this would go on for a while I would say forget it, you just, you just don't have what it takes and what it takes more than anything is this energetic drive that you can't live a day without doing it. I said, yeah. you should be coming to me with 30 or 40 drawings every week. To come to me with two or three drawings after a week tells me that you don't have the spirit for this. It's not meant for you. And they would take it hard, but I felt I was doing them a service by telling them that. Because yeah. I couldn't draw enough. I couldn't draw enough. 
My wife would laugh at me at night while we were watching TV. I had a sketch pad, and I'd be drawing while we were watching TV. Because an idea could come anytime. Yeah, after I had worked an 11 hour day at the drawing board, I'd be sketching at night. She'd say, what is wrong with you? I said, it's what makes me happy. What do you want me to do? It's, it's, it's really true. I, there, I was asked to write an article about uh, Steve Gerber once, and, and I'd heard this word before. I had to look it up to see how to spell it right. So I think it's cacoethes, which is this irresistible urge. And uh, they use it to talk about the smokers who have that addiction to smoking. Um, but it also means this is an irresistible creative urge. Just got to do it. It's in there and it's got to come out. You know. And I think if you have that, I mean, David Lapham, this kid I keep referring to, because he was great. He still is. But uh, uh, when he was trying to get in, into trying to get work in comics. He would create a batch of samples of a number of pages, and he would send them every week. And every week, I had Don Perlin, who was really good at handling young artists, and I, me too, I, I always answered submissions. So we'd write him a little note, work on this, work on that. And next week, we'd get a new batch of samples, and he worked on what we told him. And we'd send him another note, and then, he, but he kept it week after week after week, and it was a bunch of pages each week, and this guy had a job. You know, but but he would come home at night because he had that urge. He wanted to do this. He was driven. Yeah, he was. He was driven. And 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 uh, I'll tell you how driven he was. Uh, this is funny. Um, after making him jump through so many hoops, I said, I said, I gotta hire this guy. You know, so I, I hired him and I told him, I said, you're not really good enough yet. I said, but if you come to the office every day and we can look over your shoulder, you know, Don will help you. I'll help you. And you know, maybe then you can you can you can do this. Um, so he said, okay. Well, his commute was from Toms River, New Jersey to Manhattan. That's two and a half hours each way, okay, every day. And he said, okay. And he did it. And that first morning he showed up. And uh, it was the worst day of his life um, because, <laughs> I'm, because I, I gave him a script to work on. And, and I'm flying around. There was a really busy day and a lot of chaos. I'm flying around there. Perlin was flying around there. Nobody had any time to talk to him. The only thing he heard from me all day is I'd be walking quickly past his the drawing table where he's trying to work, and I'd say, eh, "That's all wrong. Start over." You know. <laughs> <laughs> and so by the end of that day, he was a freelancer, so you only get paid for what you successfully complete. At the end of that day, he completed nothing. He earned zero. Okay. So he walked out looking pretty sad. You know. And I thought that's it. We'll never see him again. You know. Next day he shows up. Wow. The kid just showed me something. So I thought, we're not going not to let him down this time. And I'm, I'll find him. I'll make him. And um, the first couple of pages, I laid him out for him, because I could do little layouts. And uh, then after that, he, after a little while, he starts to see what we're doing and why we're doing it. He's let me try. And then he would lay him out and show him to me. And I'd say, that's pretty good. I've changed this. And, and, uh, and then that, that day, he, he earned like a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> and I said, congratulations, you can make a living doing this, you know. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so, so he was a lot happier walking out that day. Uh, but I think he, just, he was just driven to do it. And, and the fact that he had the worst day on, on earth and he showed up the next day, that's something. That's something. Anyway, sorry, long story, sorry. Questions? Anybody? Funny stories? Someone you want the dirt on? <laughs> Did you want to uh, close this at 3.30? Well, yeah, yeah, I think that's where we were scheduled. All right, so we got a couple more minutes so if anybody wants. How do you deal with uh, repetitive stress? Alice? How do I? Repetitive stress. 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 Uh, if I told you the truth about my physical condition, it would depress you. <laughs> um, I'll leave it at that. I, I, I need surgeries. I need a, a few things. Um, but uh, I can't have it done now, but someday I will. I never had a problem with it, you know, drawing or... And in the first 30 years I was a writer, I wrote everything longhand because I couldn't type. And, um, and uh, then I was unemployed for a while, and uh, my friend Chuck Rozanski said, I just want to send you an email. I said, Chuck, I don't have a computer. You know, he said, and if I had one, I wouldn't have time to learn because I'm busy trying to get a job. So I come home uh, one night, and there's big boxes 
the doorman says, these are for you. I said, I don't, I don't order anything. Computer, printer, <laughs> keyboard. And because uh, I had helped Chuck out once early on in his, in his checker career. And, and so he, he, he uh, uh, there was a note that said, interest on the loan. <laughs> and uh, so now it's sitting in my living room. I had to learn how to use it. And I got to the point where I can type with two fingers. It was pretty fast. Pretty fast. And uh, as fast as I can think. So that's a good combination. And, uh, and so, but uh, even that has not, you know, hurt my hands at all. So I don't know. Maybe I just, you know, I'm not susceptible. I'll give you one, one response that I must be pretty good because I haven't felt the top half of any of my fingers in about four years. <laughs> so I've essentially been drawing with 10 numb fingers. And I'll sell you, he's pretty good. <laughs> he's really so, good. Imagine if I could feel my fingers, how good I could do. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Yeah. We done? I uh, more so, we've got time for one question. Uh, you offer to get the dirt from people. Uh, <laughs> don't know if the timelines kind of work out with either of you, but if either of you guys ever work with Todd McFarland? Oh, yeah. What's he like that we wouldn't know? He's a nice guy. He's a really nice guy. No, when when Todd Todd first came to town to, to, to be a cartoonist, he he moved to New York. He lived in Vancouver at that time. He was born in Calgary, and he moved to New York, and he got because he got some work from DC Comics, and he's going along. And of course, he needed to get a green card, you know, eventually, and so he asked DC Comics if they would give him the, the paperwork. They have to guarantee him work and stuff like that, and they wouldn't. So he came to see me. At Marvel, you know, the, the Evil Empire, and uh, he came in and he showed me his stuff. And I looked real good, and I said, "Yeah, okay, well, I'll give you a guarantee." So I filled out whatever form you had to fill out, and uh, wrote a letter. I, I don't remember, but I did whatever you had to do. And so uh, he got his green card. It was actually about the time I left Marvel, just a, maybe a month later, I left Marvel. So I never actually saw any of his first stuff uh, until it was in print, you know. Uh, and he was, I guess, he was working on Spider-Man and. and and boy, stuff is good, you know? And so I've run into him here and there along the way. He's always nice. He's just he's just a, such a nice guy. He's 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 grateful for all that's happened to him. And and uh, I was in, in Calgary with him and, and I think Stan was there too. They both had these long lines, you know, and uh, so I talked to a couple of people who had stood in that line for hours and they said that, that when they got there, one of the reasons the line moved didn't move super fast was that Todd would always have a little tiny conversation, a couple sentences, but, but at least he would you know, acknowledge the person and, and talk to them, signed for free. Uh, you know, just was the nicest guy in the world, as nice as he could be with a thousand people in line. And, uh, and, and uh, I just heard that again and again about what a nice guy he was. And every time I've ever seen him, he's, he's happy to see me and, and, and uh, we talk. And, He's just a real nice, genuine guy. And he actually was once a minor league baseball player, so mm. it's fun to talk about. Uh, I'm done. Well, uh, we are out of time, but I just want to say thank you for coming and thank you to you gentlemen for uh, letting us uh, Our pleasure. have some insight. So. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Got to turn off airplane mode. <laughs> <laughs> So my hands still work, my legs. <laughs>